Tonight we're going to begin our study in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 20. And then we're going to try to make it all the way through uh, chapter 34 tonight. So I'm being a little ambitious. We'll see if we get it accomplished. Um, so when we... Let's pray first. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you, and we just pray that you bless and anoint this study, Lord, that it um, be a message from you to us about you, Lord, and all the wonderful things that you've done for us, Lord. I pray that you uh, just fill us anew as Joey prayed with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and help us to be humble and faithful servants for you. And for these things we ask in the precious name of Jesus, amen. All right, so when we last left off, Judah was being threatened by the Assyrians. The good king Hezekiah had prepared the city of Jerusalem and the people in the city for war. They had stopped up the springs and the wells and built up the walls, built up the towers, and, repla- and repaired the Milo. They made weapons and shields in abundance. Hezekiah set military captains over the people and gathered them to him in the open square and called for the people too. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor all the multitude that is with him. For there are more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Then Shnechrib sent his servants to Jerusalem. The servants laid siege to Jerusalem and confronted the men in the city in a language all could understand, loud enough so the men on, in the towers and on the walls could hear, describing the terrible things that had happened to the Assyrians' previous enemies from which their gods could not protect them. This tactic was used to cause the men to doubt in Hezekiah, and most of all, to doubt in their God. Shennacherib spoke blasphemies about the true and living God, and even wrote those blasphemies in a letter. Hezekiah did everything he could think of to prepare God's city and God's people for the earthly battle which was coming, and the spiritual battle Shennacherib had ignited through the blasphemies he blasphemies he spoke against the Lord. Hezekiah then took the battle to the Lord. Hezekiah, those close to him, and the prophet Isaiah prayed together, seeking a divine deliverance from the Assyrians. And God answered those prayers. So that's where we're going to pick up right here in uh, chapter 32, verse 20. Now, because of this, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah And the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, prayed and cried out to heaven. Then the Lord sent an angel who cut down every mighty man of valor, leader and captain in the camp of the king of of Assyria. So he returned, shamefaced, to his own land. And when he had gone into the temple of his God, some of his own offspring struck him down with the sword there. The actual assassination of Sennacherib by his sons occurred approximately 20 years after his defeat at Jerusalem. Verse 22, Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others, and guided them on every side. And and many brought gifts to the Lord at Jerusalem and presents to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was exalted in the sight of all nations thereafter. God's deliverance of Jerusalem and Judah from the Assyrians was a clear indication to all the surrounding kingdoms of God's favor and power. As we have seen in many previous, in many previous occasions, this awareness of God, the one true and living God, creates a fear of God which causes peace. This peace creates prosperity. Hezekiah and Jerusalem were greatly blessed by this prosperity. Verse 24. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. He prayed to the Lord, and he spoke to him and gave him a sign. This account is described in more detail in 2 Kings 
21, verse 1 through 6. And so I'm going to read that. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And, I, and Isaiah said to the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face to the, to the wall, towards the wall, and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember, O Lord, remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in tr- truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out to the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. I will surely heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add fifteen years. I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of the Assyrians, from the king of Assyria, and will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. So back to our text in 2 Chronicles, verse 25. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore, wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. The pride of Hezekiah described here is most likely because of the the accomplishments described in verses 27 through 31. So chronologically, we're just a little out of order here. Verse 26, Then Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon him upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Verse 27, Hezekiah had very great riches and honor, and he made himself treasuries for silver, for gold, for precious stones, for spices, for shields, and all kinds of desirable items, storehouses for harvest of grain, wine, and oil, and stalls for all kinds of livestock, and folds for flocks. Moreover, he provided cities for himself and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him very much property. This same Hezekiah also stopped up the water outlet of the upper Gihon and brought the water by tunnel to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered in all his works. And you can visit that tunnel to this day. So after God delivered the victory and blessed, Hez- and blessed all that Hezekiah had done, there came a great ac- accumulation of wealth. And this wealth and prosperity caught people's attentions. Verse 31, However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him in order to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. This incident was described in more detail in 2 Kings 12 through 21. So I'll read that now. At that time, Baradak Baladin, the son of Baladin, the king of Babylon, sent letters and presents to Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah was attentive to them and showed them all the house of his treasuries, the silver and gold, the spices and precious ointment, and all his armory that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his domain that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say, and from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, They came from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. 
Behold, in the days, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried away to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons whom will descend from you, whom you be, will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he said, Will there not be peace and truth at least in my days? When I first read this, this struck me as Hezekiah being very crass. And then I read a couple commentaries and they described it as Hezekiah repenting of his sins and accepting the righteous judgment of God which would come upon the kingdom. So we'll pick up in verse 32. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his goodness, indeed are they, not, are they written in the vision of Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, and in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So Hezekiah rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the upper tombs of the sons of David. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem honored him at his death. And then Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. The passing of Hezekiah concludes a great character study for us of a godly king to consider and meditate on. Hezekiah began his reign with such a heart for God and his people. Hezekiah was a faithful administrator. Most of the time, he was a good example for us to emulate. During the times of trouble, however, Hezekiah did not perform flawlessly. We remember the account in 2 Kings 18, where Hezekiah initially attempted to pay off the Assyrians by draining the king's treasuries and the treasuries of God. He even stripped the gold off the doors and the pillars of the temple to pay off Shennacherib. After doing all of that, Hezekiah remembered who his God was. He corrected his course. Hezekiah and Isaiah humbly prayed to God, and God delivered the victory. The victory brought prosperity. Prosperity brought pride to Hezekiah. We must not forget how incredibly blessed we are. And from, where, from whom those blessings come. God tells us over and over in his word not to forget him. When we are prospering, this is a very easy trap to fall into. And may it not be said of us. David Guzik said, Many men who stand strong against the temptation of failure and weakness fall under the temptations of success and strength. This is a warning. This warning is a repeated theme throughout the books of Kings and Chronicles. Kings who start out faithful and strong in their youth stumble toward the end of their lives and be, as they become comfortable in God's blessings. A humble heart, a right perspective, and a great memory are the best defenses against pride. God, our creator, God is the creator of everything seen and unseen. All the things we cherish, all the blessings, all the people we love were created and placed in our lives by God. We must never forget this. These days, seem, things seem to be falling into chaos. Things may seem scary and uncertain. But remember, God calls us to be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria or whoever or whatever is frightening you, nor before the multitude that is with him. For there are more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. We are blessed more than any other nation in history, and that is because of the blessings bestowed upon us by God. Let us not forget who our God is or the love he has shown us. Let the love of God, let the love God has shown us drive us to action for our king and the people his son died to save. So we'll begin in chapter 33, verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. Manasseh 
is the 14th king of Judah. He is the longest reigning king in Judah. And Manasseh is considered to be one of Judah's most wicked kings. Manasseh will spend the first half of his reign chasing hard after the things Hezekiah had removed from the land of Judah. Then Manasseh takes it even further. As we read through these texts, let's think back to when David's heart turned towards building a temple for the Lord. The Lord prevented David from building that temple because he was a man of war. But David's hearts and thoughts were towards the Lord as he collected and prepared the building materials and treasures for the temple. We read how David's actions blessed the Lord. And let's think back to Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple. Remember how God reacted to the prayer by filling the temple with his glory. Then remember the promises God made to Solomon, the line of David, and the Jewish people. With those portions in Scripture, those portions of Scripture in mind, let's read what Manasseh does and how it must have hurt and grieved our Lord. Verse 2. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Manasseh begins to do the same things as the Kenites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the, Ger- the Gershites and the Jebusites had done. God removed these people from the land because they were doing things which were an affront to God. Now Manasseh is doing these same things. But wait, there's more. Verse 3, For he rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. He raised up the altars for the Baals and made wooden images, and he worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. Manasseh rebuilds the things his father Hezekiah had torn down. He makes wooden images and worships all the host of heaven. He moves God's people into worshiping the stars, which is strictly forbidden by God. Verse 4, He also built altars in the house of the Lord, which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. Then Manasseh built altars to other gods in the temple, the very house David planned and Solomon built for the Lord the temple where God said he would put his name. Verse 5, And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He built more altars in the courts of the house of the Lord. Verse 6, He also caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and sorcery, and consulted mediums, and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Manasseh puts his sons through the fire. These sons were in the line of David. He practiced soothsaying, which is being able to predict the future. Witchcraft, which is using spells to influence people. This includes drugs and alcohol. Sorcery, which is considered black magic. Consulted mediums, with his telepathy or uh, clairvoyance, spiritus, which is communicating with the dead, and did much evil. He even, for seven, he even set a carved image, the idol which he made in the house of God, which God had said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tri- out of the tribes of Israel. I will put my name forever. Altars were not good enough. Now he's placing idols in the temple. Verse 8, And I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed your fathers, only if they are careful to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. God promised the Jews that, if they, that they would be unmovable from this land if they had kept his commands. It appears that Manasseh was on a mission to violate all of these commands. Verse 9, So God seduced Judah 
and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. So all the godly progress Hezekiah made moving God's people towards a right relationship with their God was removed by Manasseh. Manasseh brought everything Ahaz had done and brought it to Jerusalem. Then Manasseh took it even further, building altars to all the hosts of heaven, witchcraft, sorcery. Manasseh was one of those guys who thought if a little was good, more was better. Tradition has it that Manasseh had sawn Isaiah in two. So not only did he lead God's people astray, violate most of God's commands, but he also killed the Lord's prophets. So what does our God do to Manasseh and all the people who are following his lead? Let's pick it up in verse 10. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. Our God loved them so much that even after all of this, he warns them. This falls right along with the pattern we've been studying. When, people, when God's people go astray, God warns them. This is so incredibly important for us to know. If we, if you or I, head down a road away from God, God will warn us. If anyone in this room or listening to the sound of my voice finds themselves on a road leading away from God, from the God you once knew, please hear this warning from God. You can turn back right now. You can stop what you are doing and return to his love and his grace. So our God warns Manasseh and the people, but they would not listen. Verse 11. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. God holds people accountable for their actions. If you are the Lord's, he will not leave you in a sinful condition. He loves you too much. And he has promised to complete the good work he has begun in you. It is so much easier for us to heed, God, to heed God's warning than for us to continue down the road of sin and receive God's discipline. Verse 12. Now when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and he received his entreaty heard his supplication and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom, then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. There is an age of accountability somewhere around the age of 13, 16 or so, and I believe it's different for people with diminished capacity just because we serve a just God. So whenever that age is, God will make himself known to a person After that time, whatever that time is, each of us are accountable for the relationship we have or do not have with God. So if a person dies after that point of accountability, they will stand alone before God and are held accountable. Consider this. Manasseh grew up in Hezekiah's household. Hezekiah, the sold-out man of God, despite all that Manasseh knew, that he witnessed growing up. He didn't know God. It was only when Manasseh was stopped and isolated by the Assyrians. It was most likely in a dark and quiet place with no idols, no false gods, that Manasseh was able to hear God's still small voice. It was then that Manasseh became aware of who God truly was. This time alone with the true and living God, brought about a life-altering relationship for Manasseh. We need to have the same type of experience with God. Hopefully, we are willingly getting alone with God. Distraction-free time alone with God, where we can pray and meditate on God's Word and receive from Him. I was challenged by this section of Scripture this week. I have been spending time studying and praying, but I cannot say it was distraction-free time. Let us not forget who our enemy is and how easily he can throw us off track if we allow him room to do so. How often have you been get, began your devotion time 
and your phone starts dinging and ringing. And I, is that a coincidence? Considering who our enemy is, I don't think it is. So fun, Manasseh finally meets God and is returned to Jerusalem. So pick up in verse 14. After this, he built a wall outside the city of David on the west side of Gahon in the valley as far as the entrance of the fish gate, and it enclosed Ophel. He raised it to a very great height, and then he put military captains in all the fortified cities of Judah. He took away, all, he took away the foreign gods and the idols from the house of the Lord and all the altars he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord. And in Jerusalem, he cast them out of the city. He also repaired the altar of the Lord, sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings on it, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed on the high places, but only to the Lord their God. When Manasseh returned to Jerusalem, a changed man, his first priority was the safety of God's people, their physical safety and their spiritual safety. Manasseh built up the city walls, organized the military, and then cleaned house. All the foreign gods, idols, and altars were removed. The altar of the Lord was repaired, and he made peace offerings and thank offerings. A life changed by God produces peace and a humble thankfulness. And then we have verse 17. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed on the high places, but only to the Lord their God. Manasseh learned it is easier to lead people astray than it is to lead people back to God. They are worshiping God, but in their own way. And, is, and if that is how you feel, please know your heart is wrong towards God. It is a condition of, of your heart, or it is the condition of your heart, that matters to God. Whether he is either king of all, or he is not king at all. Verse 18. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh, his prayer to his God, and the words of the seers who spoke to him, in the name of the Lord, God of Israel. Indeed, they are written in the books of the kings of Israel. Also, his prayer, and how God received his entreaty, and all his sin and trespass, and the sites where he built high places and set up wooden images and carved images before he was humbled. Indeed, they are written among the sayings of Hosea. We do not have either of these two things mentioned here, the words of the seers or the sayings of Hosea, but I wish we did. Verse 20, So Manasseh rested with his fathers, and they buried him in his own house, and then his son Amon reigned in his place. The character study of Manasseh is a great one for all of us who have lived a portion of our lives not knowing who God is or living in direct defiance to God. I can guarantee you that no one in this sanctuary or listening to the sound of my voice has traveled to the depths with which Manasseh traveled. God put this description in his word as a reassurance to all of us that we cannot travel beyond the limits of God's grace or his love for us. As long as you have breath in your lungs, you can turn towards God and be lovingly received by him. You do not have to live a life separated from your Creator one second longer. Turn to Him. Acknowledge your sin and repent. Leave your old life of conflict with God and enter into a life of peace with Him. It has always been His plan to save you. From the foundation of the earth, God's plan was to save you. Accept the gift of His grace, His love, eternal peace and rest with Him. Do not leave this as unsettled business. God is willing to accept you as his own. It only takes one prayer to accept his gift of salvation. So let's pick up in verse 21. Amon was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. Amon was the 15th king of Judah, and we do not know a whole lot about him other than he was considered to be an evil king. Verse 22, 
But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh had done. For Amon sacrificed to all the carved images which his father Manasseh had made and served them. So here we go again, right back into idolatry and moving the people away from God. Verse 23, And he did not humble himself before the Lord, as his father Manasseh had humbled himself. But Ammon trespassed more and more. Here is the biggest difference between Manasseh and Ammon. Manasseh humbled himself and turned to God. Ammon refused. Verse 24, Then his servants conspired against him, and they killed him in his own house. It is quite possible that these servants had been down this road with Manasseh and knew where it led, and they were not willing to go there again. Instead of turning to God, they took it upon themselves to deal with the king. Verse 25, But the people of the land executed all those who had conspired against King Ammon. Then the people of the land made his son Josiah king in his place. So one evil king humbled himself turned to God and lived a changed life and is now in heaven with his creator. His son lived in in prideful rebellion and perished. So chapter 34. Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. Josiah is the 16th king of Judah. Three decades of his reign were characterized by peace, prosperity, and reform. Verse 2, And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. In the eight years, for in the eight year, eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. They broke down the altars of the Baals in his presence, and the incense altars which were above them he cut down, and the wooden images, the carved images, And the molded images he broke into pieces and made dust of them and scattered it on the graves of those who who sacrificed to them. The scattering of the dust on the graves was done to defile those graves. Verse 5, he also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 5 is referring to the altar built by Jeroboam at Bethel. Josiah's coming and his actions at this altar were (laughs) prophesied approximately 300 years prior to the fulfillment of that prophecy. That prophecy is found in 1 Kings 13.2, and I'll read it to you. Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a child Josiah, by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burned incense on you, and these bones, and these men's bones shall be burned on you. So we'll pick back up in verse 6 of chapter 34. And so he did in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, as far as Naphtali, and all around with axes. When he had broken down the altars and the wooden images, he had beaten the carved images into powder and cut down the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. That Josiah was able to travel to these lands to the north of Judah speaks about God's anointing of him. We must remember that the tribe of Israel is, no longer inhabits these lands. They have been taken, cap- taken into captivity to Babylon. These lands were close to the northern border of what used to be the old kingdom of Israel. <clears throat> Verse 8, In the eighteenth year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the temple, he sent Saphon, 
the son of Aliza, Masia, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Jehoaz, the recorder, to the house to repair the house of the Lord his God. When they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites who kept the doors had gathered from the hand of Manasseh and from Ephraim and from all the remnant of Israel, from all Judah and Benjamin, which they had brought back to Jerusalem. Then they put it in the hand of the foreman who had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they gave it to the workmen who worked in the house of the Lord to repair and restore the house. They gave it to the craftsmen and the builders to buy hewn stone, tim- timber for beams, and to floor the, hou- the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. And then the men did, and the men did the work faithfully. Their overseers were Jatha and Obadiah the Levites, the sons of Maria, and Zechariah and Meshalom, the sons of the Kohathites, to supervise others of the Levites, all of whom were skillful with instrument with instruments of music, were over the burden bearers and were overseers of all who did work in any kind of service. And some of the Levites were scribes, officers, and gatekeepers. Now when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shephan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. So Shaphan carried the book to the king bringing the king word, saying, All that was committed to your servants they are doing, and they have gathered the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and the workmen. Then Shaphan, the scribe, told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Thus it happened when the king heard the words of the law, that he tore his clothes. The work to rebuild the temple is well underway, and things are moving along nicely. The tithe money is being used to rebuild the temple, and the workmen are being faithful. Then, almost as an afterthought, Zaphon tells Josiah that Hilkiah found a book. It's like he's saying, we found this old Bible in the church we were renovating. Josiah who was serving the Lord, removing idols and pagan worship from the land, was evidently doing that from oral tradition. And now he has a copy of the scriptures. Can you imagine his excitement? Shaphan begins reading the scriptures, and things are worse than Josiah originally believed. Josiah knew Judah was receiving judgment from turning away from the Lord. But upon hearing the word of God, the cost of what Judah had done by turning away was completely clear. This grieved Josiah to his core. Verse 20, Then the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan the scribe, and Asiah, the servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because, of our, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in the book. You can almost hear the desperation in Josiah's voice as he sends the spiritual leaders to inquire of the Lord. He knows the situation of Judah is bad, and he wants to know exactly just how bad it is. Verse 22, so Hilkiah and those the king had appointed went to Huldah, the prophetess, the, son, or the wife of Shalom, the son of Tok- Tokath, the son of Has- Hasarath, the keeper of the wardrobe, 
she dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke to her to that effect. Then she answered them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants. All the curses that are written in the book which they have read before the king of Judah. We must know that God is just as faithful with his curses as he is with his promises and blessings. Verse 25, Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath will be poured out on this place and not be quenched. But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his word against this place and against its inhabitants, and you humbled yourself before me and tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place and its inhabitants. So they brought the word back to the king. Josiah learned the ultimate fate of Judah was sealed. It was sealed by Judah's collective unfaithfulness. But Josiah was assured that he would be spared from seeing the judgment because of his faithfulness. Verse 29, Then the king sent and gathered all the elders of Judah in Jerusalem. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the Levites, and all the people, great and small, and he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. It was so important that the king stood and read the scriptures to the people. This made an incredible impact on the people. Verse 31, Then the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform, to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. He made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to take a stand. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Thus Josiah removed all the abominations from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not depart from following the Lord God of their fathers. Josiah faithfully went about the work of the Lord. He knew that he, he could not stop the judgment God had proclaimed for Judah. Josiah was incredibly f a faithful servant to the Lord. The studies of Manasseh and Josiah are two wonderful and contrasting examples of Christian lives. We see both, we will see both of these men in heaven. One, life was deeply restricted by the sin which separated the sinner from his God. The other was lived with love and reverence for his God and a love for his fellow man. As, a Christ, as Christians, we prepare for the rough times in our lives using the principles laid out for us in God's Word. Learning who our God is can strengthen our faith through the study of His Word. We learn there are earthly and spiritual battles. For these battles, God has given us spiritual weapons and armor. We develop these spiritual weapons and armor through using them as God directs us, which in turn further develops our relationship with God. We begin to understand the enormity of His plan and sacrifice to save us. 
which creates a humbling in our heart. This helps us to gain a perspective of our vast weakness in comparison to the ultimate powerfulness of our God. We are to take our understanding of God's love and to use it in our earthly battles and conflicts. When we share His love with others, or we share His love with others so they can begin to understand the God who created them and His incredible plan for their salvation. We seek to know more about Him so we can share Him more. This time spent in His Word exposes more of us, who we are, to more of Him and who He is. God will point out the areas of our lives which are out of line with His. If we let Him, God will refine and mold us towards something that looks more like Him and His will for our lives. In our relationships with God, there are things He will do to, He will do in us and through us. Then there are things we must do in, re, in response to the love God has shown us. If you are listening to this study and God has revealed Himself to you, please know that's no accident. That knowledge is an evidence of God working in your life through His Holy Spirit. In the book of Matthew, chapter 16, Jesus is talking with his disciples and he asks them a question. And I will uh, will begin reading in verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said to him, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. If you have had the same revelation as Peter, there is a God Please understand that is an evidence of God working in your life. There are two things you can do with this revelation. You can do as Ammon did and ignore the revelation and perish in your sin and pride. Or you can accept God's saving gift of salvation and enter into an eternal relationship with Him. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 5, and I'm going to read it, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. If you are listening to this, and you know there is a God, and you know you are not in a right relationship with Him, or if, or if you don't know where you would go if you were to die tonight, don't let this be unsettled business for one second longer. If you are a Christian, and you have wandered away from your relationship with God, and you know He is not the Lord of your life, and you want to return and dedicate, rededicate your life to Him, then please pray this prayer with me. Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. I need and want your forgiveness. I accept your death as the penalty for my sin. I recognize that your mercy and grace are a gift. You offer me because of your great love, not based on anything I have done. Please cleanse me and make me your child. By faith, I receive you into my heart as the Son of God, and as Savior and Lord of my life. From now on, help me to live for you, with you in control of my life. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, I want to welcome you into the family of God. The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, 
that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. If you just prayed that prayer, God promises to finish the work he begun in you. In your new relationship with God, there is a God part, and there is a part for you to do. First, find a good Bible teaching church and start to learn more about the God who saved you. If you live in the Garden of Omenden area, I'd like you to invite you to come to Calvary Chapel Carson Valley. Or you can visit one of the Bible teaching churches in our area, and we are very blessed to have quite a few here. If you don't live in the area, I would suggest finding a Calvary Chapel near you, and that can be searched online. A, attending a good Bible teaching church will greatly assist you in developing your relationship with God and provide you with a wonderful resource when you have questions. Second, <clears throat> excuse me, but equally as important, you need a Bible. Think of, a Bi- think of the Bible as God's love letter to you. Set some time aside each day to read your Bible and learn more about the Lord and His great love for us and the tremendous sacrifice He made to save us. We serve a powerful and loving King who is worth getting to know, and that knowledge of Him will change your life forever. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just so in awe of what you've done for us, Lord, and you tell us in your word that it was set up from the foundations of the world. This was your plan as you made the world and us and everything that we experience in it. And that just blows us away, Lord. And we pray that you help us to grow in strength and knowledge and love with you and that you help us to become your humble servants. And for these things we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're not going to have a closing song tonight, so... You are dismissed.